welcome. I'm Stephanie with Scientists in Every Florida School, and today we're stepping into the garden, a virtual field trip series presented by Mounts Botanical Garden and Scientists in Every Florida School. Our topic today, the insect effect, insect decline, everyone, and of welcome. Our planet. Scientists in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. This program connects and builds long-term partnerships between teachers and scientists in order to bring current scientific research and big data into classrooms in Florida and beyond. My colleagues Brian and Elise and I are super excited to be with you here today. Mounts Botanical Garden is a nationally acclaimed attraction in Florida for Florida residents and visitors alike with a mission to inspire and educate through nature. I'd like to introduce Diane from Mounts who will be taking the reins from here to explore the garden and introduce not one, but two amazing scientists with us here today. Diane? Well, welcome everybody. Um, here at Mounts Botanical Garden, we love our insects and they're always busy traveling from plants uh, to plants and helping things to bloom. Um, the first thing I wanna do is actually introduce our garden to you. Uh, we have 14 acres here. Uh, our garden is separated into 25 unique garden areas, um, each of them having a different specialty. So we have some um, plants that can just grow in extreme environments. We have a butterfly garden and an edible garden and a tropical forest. Uh, we have over 2000 plant species here from all over the world. So it's kind of like when you go to a zoo and you see animals from all over the world, you're gonna come to a botanical garden and you're gonna see plants from all over the world. Um, our gardens are uh, specially planted and put together to show um, their living examples of what's possible to grow in our challenging climate. So um, as for our insects, um, you can go to the next slide, there you go. Um, uh, like I said, the, the insects are always busy traveling from plant to plant. They're pollinating the garden and making sure that everything is blooming. Um, here you see some photos of our butterfly garden. We can find many different butterfly species at any given time. Uh, we make sure to provide them with everything they could possibly want in order to keep them happy. There are food sources for all stages in their life cycles. So um, our butterfly garden specifically is filled with a large variety of host plants for egg laying and for our caterpillars to munch on. But we also have lots of plants that supply nectar for the adults. Next slide. So this is our edible garden. Um, it relies heavily on pollinators to grow a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. And most recently we had an influx of bees. They were visiting our uh, edible garden due to the new crop of sunflowers we had growing there this summer. We had a, a ton of sunflowers growing in our edible garden. It was beautiful. Next one. So um, we also have nighttime pollinators. So not all pollinators work during the day. And it's important to remember that the garden relies on our nighttime pollinators, pollinators as well. Here you see the ylang ylang tree. It's also known as the ling ling tree. Um, it's covered almost all year by these delicate yellow flowers and is most well known as one of the scents used to make Chanel number no. five. It's hard to miss the intoxicating aroma of the ylang ylang tree, but at night, the smell intensifies, attracting night pollinating insects such as moths and beetles. So at this time, we would like to introduce you to our fearless scientists and extraordinary bug experts, Dr. Jarrett Daniels and Dr. Akito Kawahara. Both of them are curators at the Florida Museum of Natural History, History McGuire Center for Lepidoptera, which is a fancy word for butterflies and moths. Um, it's in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, um, we just wanna ask you guys to please post any questions you have in the chat box and we'll be passing the questions along to the scientists as we proceed through the presentation. And at this time, let's go explore. Hey everybody, I'm, I'm Jared Daniels. Um, and uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Diane. And I'm really happy to be here. And I'm sitting actually in my backyard. So I'm gonna show you today some of the cool bugs that just happened to come by right by my house without having to go very far. Akito? Yeah, my name is uh, Akito Kawahara and I'm, I'm at the McGuire Center uh, for Lepidoptera, same place that uh, Jarrett works at. I'm, I'm actually in my office right by the collections. It's one of the biggest collections in the world of all kinds of uh, butterflies and moths. And uh, today I'm gonna give you a little presentation about how I got into um, entomology and insects and also show you some cool pets that my daughter has accumulated in, in our living room and, and I'll show you them. 
So I, I can start if you want. So um, again, all the, all the insects that you're gonna see today with the exception of one were collected right here in my backyard. And we wanna emphasize that insects are all around. You don't have to go very far. You don't have to travel miles from your house to explore this really exciting world. So be a, a junior explorer right in your own backyard. And one of the cool insects that's out in pretty good force right now are these guys, these are katydids. And so these are herbivorous insects and they are found during the daytime on plants. They're herbivores and they blend seamlessly into the environment. They look just like a living green leaf and they're completely harmless. They can fly, they can hop, they have really long legs. Uh, they might regurgitate a little bit if they're uh, kind of molested, but they're harmless. You can put them on your nose and nothing's gonna happen, right? They're really super cool guys. And then you can also explore in your yard to find all sorts of different cool caterpillars. So we have uh, right here, this is a uh, common buckeye caterpillar. It's a really spiny little caterpillar. And you might think, well, it has irritating spines or it's gonna be really um, kind of dangerous to touch, but it's really quite soft. And this is a, a full grown caterpillar. It'll turn into a, a big butterfly about two inches or three inches in wingspan with big target shaped eye spots. Really one of the coolest butterflies in Florida. And further down, this is the pupa of that little caterpillar. So these are almost fully grown. They're getting ready to pupate. And again, you can experience the whole life cycle of butterflies and moths and many other insects right in your backyard without going very far at all. So it's a great way to explore. And then some insects are super colorful. So this is a, a polka dot moth. This is a daytime pollinating moth. And it's um, it, it's pretty common, particularly in South and Central Florida. It feeds on oleander and it's called a polka dot moth because it's black and iridescent blue with white spots and a really bright orange abdomen. And it mimics a wasp to try to avoid being eaten by a predator. And these are just you know some common things that you can easily find, again, right in your backyard. And the other thing to keep in mind is the fact that if, even if you don't find the insects themselves, you can look for signs that insects are there. So another thing that I found right outside my door is this, this is a cicada shell. And so the nymphs of the cicada live underground. They feed on the roots of uh, shrubs and trees, and then they crawl to the surface and they molt to become an adult uh, cicada. And you can find these little kind of hardened brown shells all around on the side of your house, on trunks of trees, on vegetation. And it's a sign that Obviously, they were living right beneath your footsteps for a long period of time and then came above and molted to become an adult cicada, which looks very much like a large horsefly. So all sorts of really cool things to look at. And then because we are talking about the insect decline, my lab particularly works on species of butterflies and moths that are not doing very well, that are either federally endangered or otherwise declining. And so this is probably one of the rarest butterflies in Florida. This is called Shouse's Swallowtail. It only occurs in the Florida Keys, and this is a full-grown caterpillar of it. And in the wild back in 2012, there were only four of these butterflies found in the entirety of Florida. So it is really one of the rarest butterflies. And we breed these guys in our lab, and we release the butterflies back into the wild to hopefully ensure that the populations continue to build up and uh, eventually it hopefully will be taken off the endangered species list. But again, keep in mind that not all the insects that you see around are common. Many of them are uh, really facing pretty severe challenges. So I have a quick question I'm gonna throw out there from two audience members. Uh, Gavin and Emma both want to know what is your favorite bug that you study? Well, that's a hard one, boy, there's, there's so many choices. So I'm gonna pick, um, this little blue butterfly called the Miami Blue because I've been working on that butterfly for about 25 years. And it's another extremely rare butterfly. It only occurs in the Florida Keys right now. And again, it was thought to be extinct in Florida and was rediscovered in 1999 in a small little state park in the lower Florida Keys called Bahia Honda State Park. So, and it was actually discovered by um, just an amateur going out in the field and taking pictures. So it emphasizes also that there are these really great discoveries to be made by anybody out in the field. It doesn't have to be scientists. We can all make really cool discoveries. And 
we are working on that butterfly in the lab, breeding it and releasing it back into the wild. Uh, and hopefully it will, um, you know, expand its range and it someday be uh, much more common than it is currently. Can I but, just you know, How about you? Tell us a little bit oh. about your favorites too and, and a little bit about what you've got. Yeah, so um, my favorites are definitely moths. I'm, I'm a big fan of moths. Um, there are uh, over 160,000 species of moths on the planet. Um, and I mean, I'm not trying to take away anything from butterflies. Butterflies are super cool too. But, but there's only about ten, a tenth. There's about, you know, 20, 000, maybe like 19,000 species of butterflies and about 160 or 170,000 species of moths. So there's a lot of moths out there. And um, I'm super interested in, in what moths do and how they, um, their behaviors and so forth. And I can talk about that um, in a minute um, as well. But just, just kind of going off on what Jarrett was talking about, there are something, it's something like 10 quintillion insects on the planet at one time. Uh, some scientists tried to figure this out. And so you count all the ants and all the things that are out there, um, 10 quintillion. I don't know how many zeros that, that is, but that's a, that's a tremendous amount. And there are more insects on the planet than any other kind of um, major animal group. Um, so, I mean, you know, we don't have enough scientists. So another thing is, well, let's, let's all, you know, try to study these things because they're, like Jarrett mentioned, you can find them in your backyard, you can find them anywhere, and we, we know virtually nothing about them. And Akito, just to follow up on that question, we have another question coming in from Jaden who asks, how many moths do you have, um, you could answer within your collection, if you have a personal collection, however you want to take that question. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, actually, I can show my presentation. Is that okay? Like right now, is this a good time to do that? And I, yeah, it kind of goes into my background a little bit. Um, sure. Why don't I do that then? Um, so... So this is a quick, uh, quick presentation, but um, I grew up in Japan, so I'm Japanese. And um, when I was a little kid, I used to uh, collect bugs a lot. And this happened because I had teachers and uh, parents and people around me. And the culture in Japan generally supports um, the idea of going outside and collecting insects. And so this is a picture of my sister and I back then. Um, and then um, another place that I got really inspired by insects is actually at the department store. So if you go to a department store in Japan, they sell beetles. So here are a bunch of cages that you can uh, find at a department store and they sell them in these little kind of containers and, and, they're, and they're pets. And this one, this pair, this male and a female, goes for about $25. Uh, in some cases, these stag beetles get so huge. I mean, look at this thing. This guy's hand, it's on this person's hand and it's, and it's almost, you know, almost the size of the hand. And this one sold for an incredible $90,000. So it was actually sold in an auction and all these people bid on this, this beetle and it was sold as a pet because it lives for five years or so and somebody wanted to keep it and it went for $90,000. But my, my interest really is, is in the, the insects that fly at night. And when we think of pollinators and we think of insects, we oftentimes think of you know, things we see in our backyard uh, at the flowers and so forth. But we have to remember that many, many insects are active at night and all this stuff is happening um, as these insects are, are flying around and um, um, doing these things. So um, my, my real interest is what's going on with the, with the moths at night and why are there so many of them? And um, so what, what I do um, is I'm interested in um, the interaction specifically with bats and moths. So there are these moths that are flying around um, and they're really important as food sources for other animals like birds and, and here in this case bats and bats can't survive if, if there aren't many moths out there so when we talk about insect declines it's not just about losing the insects but it's also about losing all the other animals that rely on them and these are just videos showing how um, bats capture them but they use their wings to, to capture the, these, these prey and and so you know when it comes to bats and moths typically bats use sonar and then the, the bats um the sonar comes back from the the the, pre the prey in this case a moth and we're interested in trying to understand how these bats and moths interact with each other and this all happens at really high frequency and so we as human beings can't hear them and it happens um yeah it's it's really really loud out there if you go in your backyard and you use a bat detector you can buy these on like amazon they're relatively cheap now um, and you can actually see how loud it is out there 
And the moths are cool. The reason why I love moths, the question going back to why do I like moths, it's because they have these amazing things. They have these hearing organs. They actually have ears on their bodies. They can hear bats and more than 80,000 species of them can do this. And they have this weird structure on the side of the body that allows them to do this. And one thing you can do if you see a moth flying around in your house is shake your keys because when, when you shake keys, it produces ultrasound and it causes the, bat, the moths to uh, think it's a bat and it, they'll, they'll fall to the ground as a, an escape mechanism. So the one, I just have a few more slides left here, but one of the things that I'm interested in is this particular moth called the tiger moth. They can hear bats and they actually can talk back to bats too. And the reason why they can do that, and the reason why they do that is because when they're caterpillars, they feed on things like milkweed and other toxic plants. So they eat these chemicals inside and they keep them inside the body, just like monarchs. And then when they, um, when they become adults, they use their sounds to tell bats that they're toxic. Um, and this is called acoustic warning. So here's an example um, done, done in a research lab of a moth that produces sounds at bats. And the bats hear the sound and then they decide, I'm not going to eat this guy because he's chemically defended. So it's essentially the same thing that happens with monarchs, but it's happening all at night. So this world of uh, that, that happens at night is something we don't really understand at all. And we're just learning um, some of these really amazing things. So here's uh, a, a moth called the moon moth. One of the things that we've been interested in, why do these moths have these tails? And one really common species that's found here in Florida is this luna moth. And you can find them, they come to your lights and everything. Um, but one thing that we wanted to figure out is how do these moths uh, or, or why do these tails, um, why do these moths have these tails? And it turns out that the luna moth tails are a defense against bats. So they spin when they fly and the bats think it's a little tiny moth. They can't see the big moth, but they see the little tail spinning behind it and they, they grab that part and the moth survives. And that's essentially um, kind of in a nutshell how I became um, an, an, an entomologist and a scientist. And uh, it all started when I was a little kid and I just followed that passion. And I hope that many people can also follow this because there's just so much to learn. And all this stuff you can, as Jared mentioned, we could do it in our backyards. I mean, it's essentially here in Florida, it's like the best place to do it because there's so much diversity. So yeah, anyway, that's my quick. There's uh, a fourth grade group in, at Central Park Elementary that's got a great question. They wanna know if moths and butterflies are related. Um, yes, they're related. Uh, I'll just say, I guess, that uh, butterflies are, are really just day-flying moths. Um, some people will argue against this, but but the, the butterflies are, are a group of, of moths. I mean, if you think of it sort of, I mean, they're, yeah, we don't have to get into the details, but. Are but, there other main differences besides the day and the night flying? How would yeah, you distinguish so, between the two? Yeah, so some typical ways we can tell them is like by the antenna, uh, for example. Um, the moths, uh, butterflies typically have a clubbed antenna. So they, they have like a thin um, antenna and then there's like a club on the tip or a hook on the tip, whereas moths tend to be very feathery um, or, or very thin. Um, so those are kind of general um, ways we can tell. And I do want to emphasize that, you know, one, one cool thing about studying insects is insects do really weird things. And there's, there's the commonalities across different groups often are blurred. So that little moth that I showed earlier, the polka dot moth is a day flying moth. So not all moths fly at night. So it's hard sometimes to speak in generalities when it comes to insects because they're so diverse and they do so many cool things. And, yeah, and I actually, also wanted, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say that there's actually a, a butterfly that's also nocturnal. There's, there's, yeah. a, there's a butterfly that only flies at night. It's very cool. And I think, you know, building on what Akito said, what's what's really cool about his work is he is exploring this nighttime world that very few people get to see. But, you know, even in your backyard, it's not just the insects that are visible. You turn over a log or a stone. There's all sorts of cool things there. You go to a, a pond near your house and you'll find dragonflies that live as nymphs in the water. And then they're terrestrial as adults and they fly around in a much broader area. So there, there's so many cool areas to look for insects and they're not always just obvious, but if you know how to look, it's a treasure trove out there. So we have yeah. another question that just came in from Frankie and Riley and they're curious, when a caterpillar is fuzzy, does that mean it's also poisonous? Uh, so I, I guess I can answer this. So not, not necessarily. So the hairs serve a number of different purposes and actually, um, when you talk about butterfly caterpillars, there are none that have kind of stinging spines. Almost all the 
stinging kind of irritating spines are relegated to moths. So, you know, you do want to be cautious if you find a fuzzy caterpillar to just be sure, but most of them are perfectly harmless and they actually serve other roles for defense uh, than, you know, they're not worried about, you know, humans as a predator. Yeah, most, most, most things that have hairs are not, are not um, yeah, uh, harmful. Or most insects, we should say, are not harmful to humans too. That's another thing that's really important to keep in mind. There are some that are, but that's a very, very small fraction. Interesting. Um, Jared, I know Akito touched on this a little bit about his love for insects and when he developed that love. When did you get your passion for um, insects and moths and butterflies? So, so I grew up in rural Wisconsin. I was pretty fortunate. I had a, you know, hundreds of acres as my backyard, you know, in neighboring woods and everything. And when I was about five years old, my grandfather brought over a coffee can, an old coffee can full of what turned out to be Cecropia moth caterpillars. This is a large moth that has a wingspan about five inches or so. And they spun cocoons. And when they emerged, I thought that was the best thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I was really hooked right at that point. And so even today, the smell of coffee grounds kind of reminds me of that experience, you know? And so I was totally hooked. And at that point, I, my, my parents bought me a field guide and a little net and I went out and just caught everything and kind of explored you know, my backyard. And, and I will say probably just like Akito, my parents were really encouraging. I had a lot of great people around that could encourage my interest. I think that's really, really important. And also just because Akito and I work at a natural history museum, I did an internship when I was in high school at the Milwaukee Public Museum. And that was also a pretty life-changing experience for me, getting around collections and just a bunch of other people that loved insects. And that was just another light bulb moment for me. So Jared, this is actually a perfect time to segue and ask you all this question. If uh, anybody in the audience is interested in collecting, there's, there's two things that I'm seeing in the chat box. One is if there's anything that would be detrimental or dangerous or harmful to the insect for touching them. And secondly, if you were to collect, what kind of tools would you recommend um, students use to do so? So you can buy a, an insect net. Uh, there are many places you can buy them. They're, they're super great tools. You can use them as a sweep net. You can catch things that are flying. And then I would, I would try to get a, a plastic container and like um, an old peanut butter plastic container is great if you wash it out really well. And then you can capture the insect either off a plant or out of the net and put it in a container like this. So you can easily watch it. And that way it's not gonna, hurt you and you're not going to hurt the insect because they are pretty fragile and we don't want to we don't want to injure them we want to have respect for the insects because they're they're really cool and really important so you know things like this are really useful the other thing is a pair of forceps so i have a pair of forceps with a dragonfly on here and you can buy these at a, a stamp and coin shop you can buy them off the internet and these are great because you can you can use these as kind of tools to pick out things you can grab things with them and they're just um a really useful tool. So those are the three things, a net, a couple of good plastic containers, and a pair of forceps. Can I show something? Is this a Absolutely. good time to do that? So this is, um, this is one of our pets that we have in our house. Um, I don't know if you can see this. This is a mantis. It's, it's, uh, my daughter called it Mr. Mantis. We've had it since, I don't know, February maybe. Um, and it's gotten this, to become this huge uh, mantis now. It's looking around, it's looking at me actually right now. It's looking at my face. Um, but these, these mantids are, are really amazing. They're predators, obviously. But it, it was originally, we thought it was Mr. Mantis. And my daughter was calling it Mr. Mantis, but it turned out to be a female. And now it's Mrs. Mantis. Um, you can see it has a giant kind of abdomen. And it actually laid an egg sac right here. So it laid this giant egg sac um, a few days ago. And now it's, it's got, I think it's got more babies that, that's coming by. So we have these really interesting um, pets that, you know, a lot of insects can be pets, even though we don't think of them as being sort of pets, right? So here's a beetle. Um, this one is, uh, this is what my daughter calls uh, banana brains because he loves bananas. Um, it's one of the biggest beetles in North America. This one came to our yard porch light, um, porch light uh, a, a few nights ago. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a, one of the beetles that kind of, it's called a rhinoceros beetle found in North America. 
And then um, I guess I'll show you one more thing real quick. I know we're kind of talking about different things, but this is a, a pretty common. Many people see these, I think, around. Um, this is a stick insect pair. Um, so it's kind of running around a little bit, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a male and a female and they're attached together and they're walking around and these guys feed on plants and uh, they're, they're, really, they're, they're really harmless. Uh, they don't do anything. They eat leaves and um, they're just kind of uh, nice, interesting insects. All of these guys can be kept as pets. Um, so I, I highly encourage uh, those who are interested in this kind of activity to try to keep um, different kinds of insects or even spiders too. I mean, tarantulas are great pets as well. They're, they're really harmless in, in most cases. So. Yeah. And the other cool thing about the insects that Akito showed is that they're, they're long lived. Not all insects have really short adult lifespans or, or lifespans in general. So um, a praying mantis can live for many months and the beetles can live for years as grubs. So uh, they can be really cool pets. Akito, Gavin is wondering, is that actually how they mate by attaching to each other while referring to that stick? Um, uh, yes, that, that, the stick insects, yes, that is how they mate too. They actually stay together for, there was actually a study that was done that uh, counted how many days. And I think the, it's like the one of the longest uh, interactions. It's, it goes like, I think the longest one is I think like 300 days or something. So yes. That and is it's also a pretty cool example, the fact that the male is a tiny little guy on top and the female is much, much larger. So, you know, species, even like this dragonfly, this is a, a an Eastern pond hawk. The male is bright blue, the female is green. So they can look very different, male and female, from one another. Jared, you mentioned some of the lifespans. Um, we have some second graders who want to know how long do typical butterflies live for? So most adult butterflies are really short-lived. They only live a few weeks, like two to three weeks max, because their, their goal is to produce more butterflies. So they have a much longer life as a caterpillar than as an adult butterfly. And of course, there are exceptions to that, like the monarch, when they're migrating, they can live for many months. And our state butterfly, the zebra longwing, one of the coolest butterflies in the state of Florida, it, it can live for months as an adult. So again, back to my comment earlier, there, there's, it's hard to talk about generalities when it comes to insects because each one is so different from one another, but generally most are pretty short-lived. So Ron from Palm Beach was asking, um, do you have any thoughts on insect on the insect allies program intended for insects to be used for dispersing genetically modified viruses to agricultural plants and fields? And are either of you involved with using native insects for countering invasive pests, which we deal with a lot in Palm Beach County? Well, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Akito, you have any kind of answers on that <laughs> no, I was one? That's a tough say, one. You want to answer this uh, one? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so we don't, Akito nor I do any uh, work with invasive control, uh, releasing uh, predators or parasitoids for control of invasive insects. Uh, but a lot of our colleagues at the University of Florida do because Florida has a tremendous number of non native invasive insects. Um, and regarding the other about dispersing genetically modified, not really. We, we, we are a little bit, the university is a little bit involved with some of the uh, genetically modified mosquito releases in the Florida Keys, but that's about it. Yeah, and that this one's of, for both. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Akito. I just wanted to just mention something real quick, which is that um, it's really important to go outside and monitor um, insects. And and this is mainly because um, there's so much happening, you know, and there's so many, as we mentioned, there's so many species of insects. But by going outside and looking at them, take a picture with your phone or, you know, with your smartphone. And there's a there's this um, a website called iNaturalist. It's also an app, which is really great because not only does it um, tell you or help you identify the insects, but it also helps um, get the information about where that particular insect was um, at a, is at a particular point in time. So then scientists can use this information to say, oh, this particular insect that actually doesn't belong here in the United States is here based on this photograph that so-and-so took. So you can make an immediate contribution right away by just going out and looking for these things. And we as scientists really need this information because it helps us figure out, you know, what's going on with insects, where are the native species going. And sure, we have our, you know, team of people that we work with, but the, the scale is so gigantic that we really need help from from all people out there and and everybody can help. And this is one way that we really think that um, everyone's contribution can, can help a, a good cause. 
And I think that's a great comment. And the other thing I'll say related to that is that you know we know so little about majority of insects, even the common species. I mean, the monarch is one of the most common butterflies, but there's so many things we don't know about it. So you know, everybody can make significant contributions, real cool discoveries, you know, right in their backyard or a neighboring park. There's so many things that we don't know. That is what's so cool about bugs. I mean, bugs are so amazing. And, and, you know, you can become a specialist immediately as a child, you can, I mean, there's so few people studying them and there's just vast areas of, of the insect world that we don't know anything, anything about. And all it requires is somebody going and spending a little time and looking at stuff and just, you know, telling, telling the world about it. Do you both mind very briefly telling us about the moment that you realized that you could become a scientist or an entomologist as a career? You, you want to lead Akito? Uh, sure. Um, so I guess for me, you know, I was just interested in bugs when I was younger. Just I thought they were cool and my dad and, and my parents supported it. And so they just like, you know, bought me a net and things like that. And I was just always playing around outdoors. And I think that experience was really important. But it was also this moment when I realized that there are, that entomology as a science is, is a real profession. And I didn't really know that until I was maybe in high school, um, when I interned, did a little internship at a, at a museum um, in New York, at the American Museum of Natural History. And that was kind of when I realized, wow, like, look at all these scientists, they're, they're actually, this is what they do as a career. And I, I learned from that moment on that I, this is what I wanted to do. And, and I had a very similar experience. So, you know, I, I think I knew from a pretty young age that I wanted to study biology, but I had no idea you can make a career out of studying insects. And when I did the internship at the Milwaukee Public Museum and saw other entomologists, I was like, I didn't, wow, I was like a aha moment. Like I can actually have a career studying insects. How, how cool is that? And I just, you know, from that moment on, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Thank you. Our next question comes from students from Sculptor who ask, um, is pest, are pesticides the main cause of decline in insect population? So I, I think Akita and I can kind of go together on this one and say that uh, there's so many different drivers of decline. Certainly pesticides are uh, a factor, especially agricultural pesticides, but habitat loss is the really the main driver out there for all biodiversity loss. and there are other, other important factors, light pollution, um, uh, climate change, all of these things, but it really boils down to habitat. We're, we're losing so much habitat that species are declining. Right, and actually, if, 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 if it's okay to just sort of say one more thing, is that when we think of habitats, we think of them as being, you know, like a forest or something or some kind of um, some structure. But we also have to think that the habitats themselves are also changing. And that is actually also habitat loss, right? So one big factor that a lot of people, a lot of scientists are now focusing on is climate. Because, you know, this last, this, this past summer, it was over 100 degrees in Siberia. Like these amazing sort of or incredible events are happening in the world, which is has never happened before. So the habitat itself, Siberia might still sort of look the same, right, sort of on the outside, but the temperature was so high there that it's a completely different sort of uninhabitable habitat. So we have to think about the, the, the impact of the, the climate is, is huge. And, and so we, we need to think about both the physical loss of the habitat, but also what's actually happening to the habitats themselves. So it's like multiple multiple issues, in addition to like pesticides and all these other things too. It's, 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 a, it's complicated, there's a lot going on. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think the other thing that we wanna emphasize with the insect effect is that we have to look outside of natural habitats now that, you know, you can plant a landscape in your home, you know, around your home or in your community and that can add resources and actually create little habitat for insects because they don't need a lot of space, most of them. And we have to all try to work to rebuild that loss of habitat. And we can have a real impact doing that. And you can attract those insects to your yard and then the process provide homes for them and food for them. Yeah, Thank that's you, a, yeah. yeah, that's a great point, Jared. I mean, I think, you know, one thing that we, we've been sort of advocating for is, the, is to, to, to convert parts of your lawn. So lawns are a real problem. Lawns are not really helpful for insects or any kind of other, um, uh, uh, native animals um, and plants too. And so, you know, we've been saying that, you know, if you can 
convert your lawn, a little bit of your lawn into a natural habitat where you plant some native plants and let sort of the nature grow as it naturally will. Um, I think that these create little stepping stones, or little, little islands. And if you have lots of little islands, it essentially creates a big habitat, right? So, you know, I think we need to kind of step outside of our way of thinking that lawns are beautiful. And in, in, in the sense, if, you are, if you're an insect and you look at a lawn, it's essentially a desert. There's nowhere to go. It's just, you know, there's no place to, to, to survive. So um, that's something I think we need to all think about is, is the lawn situation. It's a pretty, pretty big, there's a lot of area that's being used up by lawns and we could plant native plants or flowers or, or things that will attract insects. And, and we both uh, advocate for that. And I think the other important point is you don't have to like rip out all your yard and you can make small changes and small changes are really important. Just adding a little bit of plant diversity and blooming plants. You know, you think of, think about what insects need to survive and they're pretty simple. They just need food, shelter, you know, res other resources for their life cycle. And if you provide just a little bit of that, you're gonna have a pretty big impact. So if I want to start looking for insects, where is a good place to start looking around my house? Jared, you can take this. Uh, so, you know, as soon as you step out your door, I mean, there are insects around, like look, you know, look at your porch light when you wake up in the morning, walk outside and see what insects have come to your light at night. I mean, Akito gave a great presentation about this amazing amount of life that occurs when we're sleeping. And a lot of that is attracted to artificial light. So look at your house, look at around the light. That's a great place to start in the morning and then walk out and like turn over rocks or if you have a down log in your yard, roll that over gently and look at what's underneath. It's a party under there. It's like amazing, cool things are happening. And just look on the plants, on the flowers that you see in pretty much everywhere you look, there are either insects or signs that insects are there or have been there. This is kind of switching gears a slight bit, but Mrs. Miller's class wants to know, is there any other insects that go through a complete metamorphosis other than butterflies and moths? Yeah, um, so yes, the beetles, flies, um, all, in, all of the major insect groups that have a pupal stage goes through a complete metamorphosis. So four stages, right? So it's egg, caterpillar, or larva, uh, pupa, and adult. So beetles, butterflies and moths, um, Flies, uh, what do I miss? Oh, uh, sp uh, wasps and, and bees, uh, all these groups do it. So, if a student were to turn over a log in their yard and find some kind of larval stage of an insect, how would they know what to do in order to rear it to see what it becomes? I should take that one, Akito. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think the first thing to do is try to figure out what it is, right? So you could use iNaturalist, perhaps take a picture and use the app. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, and oftentimes we'll get you kind of in the right area in terms of the identification. Um, so I would say try to figure out what it is first, um, because what they do is going to depend, you know, how to grow it or whatever is going to require uh, understanding what it actually is. So I would say do that first. But um, I, I would I would advocate for definitely like yeah try to try to rear it and see what happens because it's it's pretty amazing and if it's found under a log it's probably that's probably the habitat that it likes so if you can like somehow create that in a in a container or a cage and then watch it uh, you know something like that I, I think would be great to do and I, I think it's important to also say that you know these are living organisms so Akito's daughter and his family take really good care of that mantis as an example. So you, you have to treat it like a pet. It needs food, it needs care regularly. And the same thing if you go out and you turn over a log, make sure that when you're done looking, you gently roll the log back over because that's the home, the habitat for those insects. We wanna make sure they're safe and sound. So it, it kind of goes both ways. We wanna appreciate and learn about them, but we have to take care of those as well. So we have, um... We have so so my wife is a is a uh, spider expert, and she teaches all these classes on spiders and stuff. And our living room has turned into this giant sort of spider. I don't know. There's like 40 spiders or something, and they're all in these little containers. So here's one, for example. This is a tarantula. They're, 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 it's right here. It's actually crawling down this tube. Um, <clears throat> but this is a really good point because every week we do a, a thing where we just do a feeding session. So my daughter goes and she drops a little like food into all the little cages and everybody gets fed at the same time. It's kind of, it's just, it's really, they're all just pets, you know, it's just having a, a lot of pets in, in your, in your home. 
Palm Beach Day has a question in reference to um, starting insect collections or talking with young ones about insects. If you're somewhat scared, what's a good place to kind of dip your feet in, or your toes into the pool, so to speak? Uh, I think butterflies and moths is a great group because generally they're harmless, right? Butterflies are entirely harmful, harmless. Adult moths are harmless. There are only a few stinging caterpillars that you can run into, but they're, they're big, they're showy, they're all around, they're easy to collect. Um, that's a great group to start with. Yeah, I agree completely. I think butterflies are the, a great place to start, but maybe dragonflies, I don't know, something like that. Speaking of dragonflies, can you tell us a little bit about the predator-prey relationship with them? Because they're pretty interesting. Uh, sure, yeah. So they're, they're, they're predators both as adults and immatures. So the immatures are aquatic. They live in fresh water. And you can, you can you go to a neighboring pond near your house. You can often see them on the floor of the pond, or you can use a little dip net and kind of drag down, and you can, you can find these pretty commonly. Uh, and they're feeding on all sorts of uh, aquatic insects and other arthropods. And then as adults, they're really amazing flying machines. They, they have, it, people build drones that fly like um, dragonflies and damselflies, but they're really fast moving and they have these really cool legs that kind of form a basket out front as they're flying along and they grab insects and they can also grab insects off of plant material uh, and they have very large eyes, so they're great visual hunting predators and large mandibles to chew up their prey. So they're, they're amazing organisms and a great they're group incredible. to start paying incredible. attention to. I mean, so they're one of the few groups of animals, I think maybe the only, I don't know exactly, but they have near 360 degree of vision. So they can essentially see behind them, they can see in front of them, and they're doing this at speeds of, you know, 60 miles an hour or whatever they're flying at. And, and that's why you oftentimes see dragonflies kind of like if you go to a park or an open field, you see them kind of cruising around. So what they're actually doing is they're oftentimes hunting for prey. So they're looking for little mosquitoes or little flies or something, and they can see these tiny things flying in the air, and then they'll dive down and they'll grab them with their baskets and then they just eat them. I mean, it's, they're voracious predators and I mean, they're just incredible. They're fascinating. And, and they can capture prey, pretty, pretty big size prey, like even adult butterflies I've seen many yeah, capture. Yeah. So they're, they're pretty ferocious. They're like little, truly little flying dragons. And as Akita mentioned, because of that really wonderful eyesight, they're really hard to capture. They can make an, a normal entomologist look pretty foolish flying, uh, trying to yield a net uh, to capture them. Yeah, and the, sorry, I'm just going to say one more quick thing is that the immatures that live in the water that Jared just mentioned, um, they also are, are pretty voracious predators too. They actually feed on oftentimes on insects, but also on things like fish, tadpoles. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they have these incredible sort of grasping um, mouth parts that like catch these uh, moving fish and, and things like that in the water. Um, they're, they're amazing. And they don't have a pupa too, which is really cool too. So if you actually have a, um, a bunch of um, dragonflies um, in, in, you hold them in you know, a cage or something, they, the dragonfly nymph or the immature will come up uh, at a certain point and just like a cicada, it'll just, the adult will come out um, uh, like on a stem or something if it's, if it's available. Thank you. I Akita. have a complete vision of you all chasing monster <laughs> or dragonflies around right now with that. Dragonflies are hard. They're really <laughs> Go we ahead, have, Brian. We have time for about two more questions or so. And our next one is, if I don't have a lawn or besides lawn maintenance, what are some other things that I could do to support insect populations? Yeah, that's great. I mean, if you if you have a balcony, if you have uh, any, like, just a little bit of space outside of a window, um, just have planting little flowers, you know, little plants, uh, these make differences. And um, bugs can, you know, they have incredible sense of smell and sight and, and they will come to these, these, these um, uh, plants. So I, I would advocate for something like that if you can do that. I was just gonna, gonna say, I'll ask another question. Uh, we had a, an interesting question when we were on the subject of food. Someone asked the question about what do adult moths eat? And I think that's a really interesting one. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, sure, yeah. So adult moths, um, so butterflies and moths, almost all of them have a, a proboscis or a straw. So it's, a, it's essentially a fluid uh, feeding uh, mouth part. And, and so moths, just like butterflies, will come to flowers. 
Um, there's some flowers that only bloom at night, so they're specifically for moths. You know, like a, a great example is a, a hawk moth. Um, they hover at flowers, and they have uh, many of them have these really, really long uh, uh, tongues or mouth parts, and they drink from uh, nectar from the flower. But also, they pollinate the flowers too. So they they have oftentimes very close interactions with the plants, um, and and the plants rely on the moths as well. Um, but they but moths feed on all kinds of things like tree sap. That you'll moths come to everything i'm just like butterflies and, and there are some like akito mentioned earlier the luna moth and the that group oh, of yes. giant yeah. silkworm moths that actually don't have have any functional mouth parts at all so they live off the reserves that they acquire as a caterpillar and they have a pretty short lifespan but they're they're super big and bulky but they don't feed at all as adults yeah they don't have functional mouth parts they can't eat as adults so aiden is wondering what are dragonflies doing when it looks like they're fighting each other? <laughs> this is a good one. I love this. Yeah, one. go ahead. Go, no, go no, ahead. no, no, go ahead. I've already talked about a lot about dragonflies. Well, they're, 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 they are pretty territorial uh, organisms. So they are, they do establish territories over ponds um, and defend those from rival males to try to find females for, for mating. Um, and you also often get really kind of large aggregations of dragonflies that are Kind of interacting with one another and they're usually in a large feeding frenzy for insects that are flying around in the environment. Okay and as we begin to wrap up today's presentation I'm just going to ask each of you if you have any quick final thoughts that you'd like to leave our attendees with and I'll turn things over to Stephanie for our conclusion of today's presentation. So, so I would just say you know get outside look uh, and you know there's so many insects around to enjoy and you know, just go explore and find them and learn about them uh, and use tools like iNaturalist to report your findings. They're, it's just a wonderful world of discovery out there right outside your door. You don't have to go far at all. Yeah, and I would just say that bugs, bugs are just amazing. I mean, every day I learn something crazy and new about a bug and, and it's, it's like, you know, I've been doing this for like 30 years or whatever my life and and I still find amazing amazing things all the time so if you know I guess my one thing advice is is um, if if you're thinking about you know what you want to do in your life um, and what you want to be when you get older or something like that I would say really think about being a scientist. I mean, there's so much we don't know and there's so much we can learn. Um, you know, we're creating drones from, from insects, you know, using them as models. We get silk from insects. We get all kinds of resources from insects, but there's just so few people that even understand what, what the insects um, are doing and what we can, there's so much we can actually learn from them. And um, we just need, I think as a scientist, I would love to see more entomologists. Um, it's just a field that's vast and, and extraordinary and, and it, it brings wonder and and delight like on a, on a daily basis um, so I, I would say yeah think about being an entomologist bugs are amazing well you both are really truly inspiring this has been so exciting and i know that i personally certainly respect the insects more than i did before uh 30 40 minutes ago so thank you for that um again respect the insects thanks to doctors kawahara and daniels for giving us a fascinating look at backyard insects, why they're important, how you can protect them. To take the insect pledge and find more insect related resources and information, you can click on the link provided here, uh, as well as in the chat box. You can also, teachers and parents on the call, um, check out the insect effect project on iNaturalist we talked about today. Classes or families can upload photos of insects you find in your neighborhoods, and you can see what other Floridians are finding in theirs. Uh, to join that project, you can once again uh, find that link in the chat box or on the screen that you see here before you. You can also find uh, more about this and iNaturalist on today's Facebook event page. We would also love for you to take a quick moment at the end of today's presentation to fill out the survey. Um, you can find that at bit.ly forward slash survey dash insect effect and again in the chat box. And finally, you can learn more about Mounts Botanical Garden and the SUFS programs by visiting our websites that you see here on your screen, by following us on social media and on our YouTube channels, where you'll find a recording of today's program and other educational resource materials found there as well. We hope that we see you next virtual field trip, which will be a collaboration again on October 20th, entitled Plant Trickery. 
the, the secret communication between plants and animals. So again, thank you so much to everyone and have a wonderful time. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.